The reading for today is the reading of Jesus appearing to his disciples in the upper room. And it's a reminder to us that in his resurrected state, our Lord comes to be among his people with a message of peace and forgiveness. So that will be the focus of our service today. Our opening hymn this day is the hymn, The Day of Resurrection. <clears throat> The day of resurrection, earth fell it out abroad. The Passover of gladness, the Passover of God. From death to life eternal, from earth unto the sky. Our Christ hath brought us so O God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hands. The depth of the hills is his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. Almighty God, grant that we who have celebrated the Lord's resurrection may by your grace confess in our lives and conversation that Jesus is Lord and God, through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson appointed for the second Sunday of Easter is taken from the book of Acts, the fifth chapter.
But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things, and so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee on the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders to put the men outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, Thuidus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about four hundred, joined him. He was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished, and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice, and when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel for this day is taken from the Gospel according to St. John, the 20th chapter. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold the forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But, when he, said, but he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. The sermon again is titled, These Things Did Thomas Count as Real? And we'll sing the hymn to the tune of the doxology. These things did Thomas count as real, the warmth of blood, the chill of steel, the Love is in of 
Savior Jesus Christ. The text is from the Gospel lesson this day, John chapter 20. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. So far the text. Dear friends, the events that we just read about in the Gospel lesson and repeated in the text took place on the evening of the Day of Resurrection. Now for us who are gathered here this day in worship, we've had an entire week now to comprehend and to digest the message that He is risen. He is risen indeed. And for many of us, we've gone back to our regular routines and patterns. The routine of Lent is over. The joy of Easter is here. We celebrated last week as much as we could under the current circumstances. But for most of us, we've moved on. But in the Gospel reading today, we are witnessing those who are still receiving the message of resurrection. They're still trying to wrap their minds and their hearts around what it is that has been reported about the tomb being empty, about the vision of angels, about the reports of the women, about Peter and John running to the tomb. We know that there's confusion. We know that there's uncertainty. We know that the followers of Jesus are on different levels of understanding and belief at this point. Jesus has appeared to some and not to others. Others have believed the vision of the angels. Others come to believe when they see the risen Christ on the road. We are told in John's Gospel that John and Peter, although they did not yet understand everything, did believe, did have faith. But there was uncertainty. There was still this confusion, this lack of any type of certainty or of a timeline as to how these things happened or how they could possibly be true. We read about the disciples being together in a locked room. Even though the message of the resurrection has been proclaimed to them, even though the women have come and told them the message of the angels and John and Peter and who knows what other ones have gone and seen for themselves the open tomb, there is still fear. Because even though they have faith in the presence and the promise of a resurrection, in the fulfillment of Jesus' own words that he would be raised to life again after being handed over and killed for the sake of the people, 
there's still an earthly thing, earthly consequences, earthly enemies that cause the people of God at this time to be fearful. For those who have faith in the resurrection promise, the eternal consequences, the eternal questions have been answered. But they still feel that their lives and their physical being are in mortal danger. So they're locked together for fear of those who would harm them. In the midst of this, in the midst of this gathering of fear and uncertainty and I guess you could say inequality of understanding at this point, the risen Lord comes to be among them. He's come to those whom he has called into his work. He's come to those that he will entrust his church to. And he announces himself. And the very first thing that the risen Lord says to those whom he has called into his service is the word peace. He says, peace be with you. So much this season, I pointed out when something is a gospel statement. A gospel statement is when the promise of God is made known to us by something that he or his son Jesus has proclaimed or taught or symbolized. It may be a parable or a merciful action. Those four words, peace be with you, is a gospel statement because in those words, our Lord is declaring that there is now a unity, there is a peace, there is an assurance between God and those who be created in his image because of the work of the one who is Christ, because of his suffering and death, because of his taking upon himself the guilt of sin, because of his resurrection. Peace, oneness, unity, restoration have all come to us with our Creator. But think about what's going on in the hearts and minds of those who are hearing the message of the risen Lord. They're, de they're gathered together, they're fearful, they're on edge, there's confusion, there's uncertainty, there's different levels of understanding and experience to this point, and yet they all share one common factor. All those who are gathered in that room that evening pledged themselves to the defense of Christ when he told them what would be happening to him. And each one of them ran away. Each one of them deserted him. Each one of them looked after their own well-being and left him to face his tormentors by himself. Being raised in a judgmental, law-orientated society where God is seen as vengeful and vindictive and brings punishment upon those who disappoint him and disregard him, you can imagine what was going on in the heart and in the minds of those who now saw the risen Lord before them. What is he going to do to us? What is he going to say to us? What type of judgment is he going to proclaim to us? We've disappointed him. We abandoned him. We pledged ourselves to him, but did not follow through. But our Lord doesn't speak words of judgment. He doesn't speak words of anger or separation or vindictiveness. He speaks words of peace. Peace be with you, he says. Our Lord understands what human nature is. Our Lord knows the weakness that was present in those who followed him. He foretold it. When Peter pledged to stand by his side to the very end, he told Peter flat out, you will deny me three times. Our Lord has a human nature. And he understands what sin has done to that human nature, has made it weak, has made it limited, has made it fearful. That's why he came, to take that which is in us, that which is burdened by sin, that which is afflicted by it, and to overcome it. To those who are gathered in that room on that night, 
gathered in fear and trepidation, now facing a possible judgment from the one whom they have declared to be Christ, Jesus only speaks words of gospel, words of unity. Peace, he says. Peace be with you. Imagine how the dawning of understanding now begins to permeate that room. No judgment, no anger, no vindictiveness, nothing to fear within those four walls as the risen Christ makes himself known to them. Just the promise of oneness, of peace, of assurance, of love and mercy, and whatever adjective that corresponds you want to use. There's one thing wrong with the picture. Someone's missing. Poor Thomas, we say this every year, Thomas gets a bad rap. Known as Doubting Thomas through the millennium. Thomas the one who wouldn't believe. Thomas the one who was filled with doubt. Thomas the one who has to be shown, guided by the hand. But remember, Thomas, in his unbelieving state, is in the same situation that the others were before the risen Lord had been made known to them. Thomas says, I can't. I can't believe it. It's too much. It's too much for him to wrap his mind around. He says, unless I put my fingers into the holes in his hands and push my hand into his side, I can't believe it. It's too much. So eight days later, the disciples are together. Jesus again appears among them with that gospel message. He says, peace be with you. It's a reminder, it's an assurance that that which was a week ago is still true and will be forever. Peace be with you, he says. But then he comes to Thomas. And he doesn't call Thomas doubting Thomas. He doesn't call him to account for his words or actions. He doesn't bring any sense of guilt Upon him. Let's read what it says. He said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. See what our Lord is doing here? In his glorified, resurrected state, the Lord who has brought to completion the work of salvation comes to one who is caught up in the misery and doubt and fear that sin brings into the world. And one to one, in a very loving and gentle way, invites Thomas into a state of grace, invites him to have faith, invites him gently to believe the message of salvation and the promise of resurrection. It'd be so easy for Jesus to say, why didn't you believe? Why can't you be like them? But simply, he says, don't disbelieve, but believe. It's an invitation. The gospel is always an invitation. The gospel is always God coming to his people and presenting the plan of salvation and offering it to us that we might receive it and receive the benefits of it. The gospel is never about judgment, vindictiveness, anger, or retribution. The gospel is never tied together with guilt or force. The gospel is about God through his son Jesus Christ being among his people in that glorified state, being among us with full knowledge of who we are and the limitations that we have in our humanity coming to us in those limitations and inviting us into a relationship with himself through the gift of faith. Jesus' interaction with Thomas, we see the gospel at work in a very intimate way. The one who has brought full salvation, the one who has been confessed to be Christ, the one who by his own power was raised to life to show his victory over sin, death, and the power of evil, now comes to one who is caught up in fear and uncertainty and despair and invites him into that state of grace. This is the continuation of the Easter message of resurrection. 
Not only is our Lord raised to show his victory over sin, but that risen Lord now comes to his people, comes to us through his word, through his church, through his sacraments, comes to us with that gospel message that by his action, through his intervention, peace with God is once again ours. There's so much fear out there right now with the current circumstances, with the pandemic, with the uncertainty that it brings. None of us who are gathered this day have been through anything like this. And immediately what the evil one does is he takes the uncertainty and he takes the newness of the situation and he combines it with what we know about God in his vindictive state, in his judgmental state. He makes us think of the God of the Old Testament before the cross, where there was judgment and there was guilt. And he makes us think that that is what's happening now, that God is angry with us and that God is judging us and that God is getting back at us somehow for whatever limitations or faults that we have. But the gospel message not just of the resurrection, which we proclaimed last week, but the gospel message of Jesus' interaction with Thomas tonight gives us the assurance that God is not judgmental or vindictive or angry or seeking a way to punish us. Punishment is on the cross. The punishment for sin, the anger of God, at the separation that it brings, the vindictiveness that is placed upon our frail nature has all been taken from us and placed upon Christ as he suffered and died on that cross. Judgment is complete. It has no place now as New Testament believers. The cross is the source of God's anger and punishment, and when our Lord declared it is finished, it was done. So if there's no judgment for sin, if there's no separation from God because of the affliction that we have as fallen people, all that remains is mercy. All that remains is grace. All that remains is our Lord to come among us with that promise that he proclaimed to the disciples, peace be with you. And inviting us in our weakness, in our humanity, in our lowliness, to come and be in relationship with him. For he is the one who has fulfilled the promises. He is the one who has established the connection between us and our creator. He is the one who has fulfilled all things and then in that gospel approach has extended it to us, has offered it freely to us, comes to us individually like he did to Thomas and calls us into a state of faith that we might benefit from what he did on our behalf. Now, Paul and, excuse me, John ends the section by saying Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The written gospel, the purpose for it, is to show us what the disciples knew to be true. That by presenting Jesus in his role as Christ, in showing how he fulfills the prophecies, in showing the power and the authority that he had over the things of this world, in laying out in very open way his work of salvation from his arrest and betrayal to his crucifixion to the resurrection, that we would have that which is necessary, that we would have the words and the assurances to receive that invitation that our Lord brings to us. Like Thomas, he comes to us through the word. He says, don't disbelieve, but believe. Our Lord comes to us with that same gospel promise 
Peace is ours. Unity with God is established. We have the ability and the means to declare him to be Christ just as the disciples did. And in so doing, we have life in his name. Amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. The canticle is the hymn, Alleluia, Alleluia, Hearts to Heaven. It's actually the tune, Ode to Joy. Alleluia, Alleluia, hearts to heaven and voices raise. Sing to God a hymn of gladness, sing to God a hymn of praise. He who on the cross a victim for the world's salvation bled. Jesus Christ, the King of glory, now is risen from the dead. Alleluia, Christ is risen, death at last has met defeat. See the ancient powers of evil in confusion and retreat. Once he died and once was buried, now he lives forevermore. Jesus Christ, the world's Redeemer, whom we worship and adore. Let us pray for the whole people of Christ and for God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray to the Lord. <coughs> Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as, through your, as your Son, Jesus Christ, had invited Thomas into a state of grace through belief, we too give you thanks that through the word which is proclaimed to us, through the sacraments that are established, by the proclamation and witness of your holy church, we too are invited into that same state of grace and belief by the one who has risen from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Make us mindful of all that he has done, and that all that he has proclaimed in his risen state that we would see in him the establishment of peace and love and mercy with you, and that having that assurance, we would look forward to the new life that awaits us in your presence. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. During this time of uncertainty and, dis and, and concern, Lord, we pray for a spirit of peace and assurance. We pray for protection from the doubts and concerns that the evil one would bring to us. We pray for protection from those who would mix the message of law and retribution with the gospel of invitation and salvation. We pray that you would keep our eyes fixed upon the one who has given us all things, that we would focus on his mercy and his grace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are in authority, our president, our governor, our military authorities, those who direct our National Health Service. We pray for wisdom and discernment as they go about their duties and carry out their responsibilities and set policy. Father, we pray for a spirit of patience among us as we await the fulfillment of this time of separation. We pray, Lord, that together as a society, we would do that which is best for all involved, that together we might overcome then that together 
we might have peace. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, our Father, you are indeed the giver of life in this world. We ask your blessing upon your servants, Marlene Guilford, Geraldine Kelly, Charles Lewitsky, Sharon Conrad, and Mildred Young, as they celebrate their birthdays this week. We thank you for their presence among us in this community of faith, and pray your blessing would be upon them, that their hope would be in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us all. Amen. Our closing hymn is Christ the Lord is Risen Today. number in as in as the hymn in the hymnal. I want to make sure I have the right tune. Christ the Lord is risen today. Earth and heaven in chorus say, raise your joys and triumphs high. Sing ye heavens and earth reply. Love's redeeming work is done. Fought the fight, the battle won. Death in vain forbids his rise. Christ has opened paradise. Lives again our glorious King. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting? Once he died our souls to save, where thy victory, O grave. Hail the Lord of earth and heaven, praise to thee by both be given. Thee we greet triumphant now, hail the resurrection thou. God grant us a joy-filled day as we go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.